Hello everybody, welcome back. We're doing another stat medical topic. Here we're going to be talking about alcohol, alcohol withdrawal, alcohol withdrawal syndrome, alcohol related disorders. And alcohol. And alcohol, yes. As always, what we're looking to, to do first is actually define what it is we're talking about. Is that that helpful, normally? Yeah, yeah <laughs> it, it does. And so alcohol withdrawal, I, I suppose setting the context, this will be patients who are currently dependent on, on, on alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, they haven't quite been able to consume their normal and therefore they're kind of weaning off of that, unfortunately, because of that dependency and what that does physiologically. Yeah. They start to get symptoms, don't they? And and essentially those symptoms are as a result of uh, not having enough alcohol and therefore Mm -hmm. not having enough inhibition in in the CNS, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit. And so you get quite a lot of almost adrenergic type Mm -hmm. stimulation, which is um, really, really uncomfortable. And so... It's a really broad definition, alcohol withdrawal, um, and, um, and we tend to classify it as a syndrome, alcohol yeah. withdrawal syndrome. And so it's a spectrum of disease. If you look at the, the DSM, essentially we have to have two or more um, of the following. So insomnia, um, autonomic dysfunction, so thinking about tachycardia, sweating, really, really common findings. Tremor, nausea, vomiting, Again, very uh, general. Agitation and anxiety, very, very common, I mm. think. And then quite often, providers will be called just after an individual has had a, a seizure. Yeah. So withdrawal-related seizure. Um, usually these are generalized seizures. Uh, right through to things like hallucinations. And, and when do these symptoms start? Really, they can start anything from hours after uh, a reduction in, in usual alcohol intake to, to, to days, really, can't they? And... Mm. Um, and, and as I said, there's a there's a real spectrum that happens here. So we talked about some of the minor um, symptoms, but you can really go from a little bit of mild anxiety, bit of non- nausea, vomiting, right the way through to that life threatening presentation of um, delirium tremens, and um, which I'm sure you see uh, more often than me. Yeah, uh, Matt, in, I, in the I emergency would hope so. department. I, I hope I see yeah. it more than you do. <laughs> yeah, otherwise the triage system for out of hours is probably not working very well. <laughs> not not typically a primary care issue. To no. Be Matt, we talked about those symptoms. What's actually the, the, the pathophys behind that? Um, and, and, you know, just go from a, a cellular level <laughs> and um, just tell me right the way up through and um, I'll go and make us a tea. Okay, brilliant. Um, <laughs> so from, from the basic cellular... No, I'm not doing basic cellular. Um, so you sort of you alluded to it um, in, your, in your lovely introduction there that really it's getting the balance right between... Mm. What well, are inhibitory effects of alcohol and the excitatory, excitatory effects mm. uh, of not having alcohol? And essentially, it's to do with the balance between GABA um, and uh, N- NMDM. <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? <laughs> it's quite tricky to say. NMDA. Yeah. Yeah. Not MDMA. Not MDMA, which is easier to say, but yeah. um, a different entity. Yeah, so it's the balance between those two neuroreceptors. So the inhibitory GABA and the excitatory, yeah. uh, excitatory other one, yeah. um, which we... Not, not to talk about. Yeah. Um, essentially, if you, when you're dependent on alcohol, when you're when you're drinking excessively every day, chronically, your body kind of gets used to that constant amount of alcohol, and ethanol stimulates GABA receptors. So that's how the inhib- inhibitory effects work. That's mm. how you get all the sort of the, you know, the drunk type symptoms that most most students, uh, most people will recognise. Mm. And if you if you're constantly having that, your body gets used to it, and so it reacts by downregulating GABA. So mm. it produces less GABA and it increases the excitatory NMDA. Um, you did it. I did it. Um, neurotransmitter. So you get that sort of natural imbalance. And essentially, if you t- then take away the stimulus of the alcohol, yeah. you lose that inhibition. So there's a, an excitatory overload, essentially. Yeah. And that's how all these symptoms to develop. We, talk, you know, we listed them there. The agitation, the anxiety, eventually leading to seizures. They're all excitatory CNS features. Yeah. You can have quite significant symptoms mm. that a lot of people would probably downplay, um, having not been, yeah. I suppose, having not been dependent. <laughs> and then, uh, it's particularly a bit of nausea, vomiting, but actually mm. the, these patients can be really unwell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, delirium and tremens is a, is a medical emergency. Yeah. You know, it's, these patients are potentially sick. Seizures are potentially life threatening. Yeah. Yeah. And comorbid as well. Yeah. These patients are yeah, often yeah. very comorbid, unfortunately. Yeah. And so, so it's quite a difficult, um, situation to have to deal with. 
So that's the definition, pathophysiology, basic science behind uh, alcohol withdrawal. Assessing these patients, Joe, what, are there any key features we need to bear in mind? Yeah, I guess, as always, we're going to start with our A to E assessment. Really, it's, it's, it's important to keep these individuals safe. Um, and what, what often that uh, might entail is as actually excluding underlying pathology underlying pathology as to why they've um, turned up because actually you can probably get an anchor bias quite easily with mm. oh this individual's here again regular yeah. A&E attender yeah. and, and alcohol dependent been in several times for alcohol withdrawal yeah. but actually this time they've got respiratory sepsis yeah. and you, you don't know about it yeah you know they get, so, that, they get that nuisance label don't yes. they and that and that yeah. filters through a lot of the staff and it's difficult to sometimes break away from that yeah so it's actually about keeping them safe from that perspective yeah and then also thinking why have they stopped drinking is this purely mm. socioeconomic financial issues mm -hmm. um you know have they been in a different environment where they've not been able to get access or have they got an underlying pathology that's kicked it off it's almost your sort of why is this individual in heart failure is it because they've had an mi and they've mm. gone into heart failure and so we really have to think is this, could this be a new onset infection? Is, is this patient having a neurological um, insult? Mm. It, what, are the, what are the differentials here that have caused this patient to stop drinking or is mm. it purely environmental? Um, what, what do you think in terms of kind of investigations then? So you're obviously going through your A to E, you're thinking about those symptoms we've talked about. Yeah, I mean, it's bloods and ECG, so mm -hmm. they're, they're presenting complaints or they're presenting features of sort of you know, the anxiety, the nausea, vomiting. Um, it may well be withdrawal, but it could also be something else. They often look pale and sweaty, as you say it could be there could be something else going on so it's mm. important to keep that that wide net and your investigation should reflect that so actually as you said there could be an underlying infection that's triggered all of this off um you want to check their lfts yeah. uh, and their liver function mm. you know you can sometimes check an alcohol level as well it's mm. not always particularly helpful and when, when you think they might be withdrawing yeah you know ecg again is is helpful because they're often a bit tachycardic and actually mm. are they tachycardic because they're withdrawing are they tachycardic because of a primary cardiac issue yeah. okay, it's important to point to assess i guess a lot of the time as well tachycardic because of you know they stop drinking tachycardic yeah. got a bit of abdominal pain then they're actually in, uh, they're actually having yeah. a pancreatic issue yeah. you know yeah and they're um, vomiting and yeah. yeah and and so so really really important yeah. what are those at-risk patients that you're going to be thinking definitely need to admit this patient what are the red flags for this presentation so if you look at nice guidelines mm. which are often a good go-to place nice will will say you should admit patients with delirium tremens yeah, or, or those at risk of developing delirium tremens, mm -hmm. which I think is something we'll probably touch on in a second. You should admit patients who have had an alcohol withdrawal seizure yeah, or again, they caveat with or at risk of having an alcohol withdrawal seizure mm. or if they're sort of frail, vulnerable, comor comorbid and things like that. Mm. So, you know, the, the alcohol excess patient who has run out of money and we're not getting any money for another week, it's not going to suddenly, well, either they're going to steal some alcohol or steal, steal some money. You know, that's an at-risk patient. They should probably come into hospital and have mm. a bit of a detox, mm. you know, some some sea wiring and stuff, which we'll talk about in a second. The, the reality, I think lots of students may well pick up on placement. that Actually, that doesn't happen a lot. I mean, delirium tremens, alcohol withdrawal seizures, or at risk of, well, actually every every alcoholic who stops drinking is at risk of those, mm -hmm. ultimately. Yeah, so it's quite um, a risk-adverse, yeah. red-flag list. Exactly. Mm. Um, and it, again, it comes down to sort of clinical judgment and having a sensible chat with the patient. Mm. And actually, a lot of these patients don't want to be in hospital. Yeah, of course. But actually, they're not in the right stage of uh, state of mind mm. or stage in their uh, wanting to become off alcohol mm. to, to suddenly do it. Mm. And actually, most inpatient medical units in the UK don't alcohol detoxes as part of their care. It's not a routine thing that's done. Yeah. So most of these patients will end up being discharged. When you do discharge them, it's important to tell them to drink. Mm. And that often comes out. You see every now and again, there'll be a media article about that. Um, somebody will say, oh, they sent my dad home and they told him to keep drinking. And actually, it's really important to prevent them withdrawing. Yeah. Actually, what yeah. we should advise is, you know, obviously it gets misconstrued in the media, but what we should advise is they go home, continue drinking, seek help through primary care, through mm. alcohol. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, maybe, yeah. or... or um or ad action, action. And, yeah, you know, you're talking about uh, what we're talking about, social prescribing. <laughs> and yeah, so, so, so those, those areas yeah. um, to, to then come off of it, not to, to have a Yeah, to have yeah. a proper rehab detox yeah. with a full bio, psycho, social yeah. impact as opposed to just the, the bio stuff that yeah. was, which would happen in an inpatient detox. Yeah, the, the time to stop drinking is not after a, a near admission from the emergency exactly. department. Yeah.